So this is part four of the Science and Principles recap. After looking at basic machines in the form of a loop of wire being rotated in a magnetic field connected to slip rings in order to produce AC, or a single loop of wire rotated in a magnetic field connected to a commutator in order to produce DC, we went on to look at frequency. Frequency is measured in Hertz, therefore another SI unit that could appear in this exam. And the frequency in the UK is 50 Hertz or 50 cycles per second. We looked at how we could produce an AC waveform by rotating a conductor 360 degrees in a magnetic field placed between a north and south pole, a pair of poles. So the machine would have a north and south pole. We said the machine had a pair of poles. And if we rotated it 50 times in one second, we would produce a frequency of 50 hertz. We then looked at if we added a second pair of poles, so in other words, another north and south, making the machine have two pairs of poles, so two souths and two norths, and we rotate the same coil of wire through the magnetic field, we had to rotate it half as fast in order to produce a 50 hertz cycle. We looked at the basic construction of a sinusoidal waveform or a sine wave, we plotted it through 360 degrees and we called this a period. The period has two peaks, one in the positive half of the cycle and one in the negative half of the cycle. We then discussed about our machines where they'd be measuring current or voltage that we insert into a circuit that doesn't measure this AC waveform that peaks in a positive and negative half of the cycle, that it actually fixes itself on the measurement of the RMS value of the cycle. RMS is represented mathematically by 0 0.707. Therefore, if the peak value of voltage was 10 volts, the RMS or the measured value from the machines that we would insert into circuit would be 7.07 .07 volts. So a mini recap then, one AC waveform is a period, a period has two peaks. We measure the RMS value, which is 0 0.07 of the peak value. We know that in order to get a complete cycle, we need to rotate our conductor 360 degrees through the magnetic field. We went on to look at simple calculations to find either frequency or periodic time. In other words, a time for one cycle. We saw the formula was frequency equals number one divided by time, and that was periodic time or the period, the one cycle time in order to work out frequency. And then we could work out periodic time by time equals one divided by frequency. After those few calculations on frequency and periodic time, we moved on to a new subject. We looked at power. Power is measured in watts and therefore can be measured in kilowatts, kilo being a thousand or mega being megawatts being a million watts of electricity. So again, we've put in a few more units there that could come up in our exam. I've seen exam questions before where just ask how much is a kilo worth? How much is a mega worth? So kilo being thousand, mega being million. A number of formulas are required to be remembered in power, but I set us the challenge of remembering just three and then using our maths to obviously rearrange those formulas. If we weren't looking for power, we were looking for one of the other elements within the construction of the formula. So the three formulas I expect us to remember are P for power equals I for current multiplied by V for voltage. The second one I expected us to remember was P, P for power equals I, I for current squared this time, multiplied by R for resistance. So power equals I squared R. And the third formula I needed us to remember was power, P, P for power equals V, V for voltage squared, divided by resistance. So it gives us the three formulas I expect us to remember. P equals I times V, P equals I squared R, and P equals V squared over R. I'd love us in the exam to be working with all three formulas, rearranging them and finding missing elements. However, our default position is to remember the three formulas and what each of the letters stand for. It might be a case of just recognizing the formula in the actual exam, not necessarily always working with it. Okay, these presentations are at the lower end of knowledge. The distinction candidates will be working with the formulas after remembering and rearranging them to find answers. We briefly looked at energy in the form of an energy meter, in other words, the electricity meter at home, and we said that energy is the kilowatt hours, and we went on to work out basic calculations to work out the kilowatt hours used by a consumer. We saw that a watt meter, in other words, to measure power, had two coils in it. One was measuring voltage and one was measuring current, and the voltage coil was a very high resistance, and the 
current core was a very low resistance. Again, these basic questions on a watt meter come up in the section on power and do not require a calculator and are worth remembering. After power, we went to look at transformers and we said that basic constructions of transformers look pretty similar in the form of a primary winding and a secondary winding. I know an auto transformer is slightly different. So let's look at the basic construction of a transformer first. Primary side winding and a secondary side winding. They are not physically connected together. They are connected together by mutual inductance. In other words, the magnetic field set up by the primary side interacts with the secondary side, but not a physical interaction. This is a rising and collapsing magnetic field which will induce an EMF into the secondary winding. For our level one and level two calculations, we said that if a transformer had, say, 100 windings primary side and 100 volts, and 100 windings secondary side, it would have a secondary side or outgoing voltage of 100 volts. We didn't really look in any detail at the losses in transformers, which will be covered at level three. We suggested the core, if there was one, because we can use air to have the magnetic field pass through air, but if we were to have a core in our transformer, we like to use a material that's easily magnetized, such as soft iron. We then went on to look at how voltage can be stepped up and down through the transformer. This is AC voltage, remember, and not DC. We cannot transform DC voltage, it's only AC voltage that can be transformed. Again, that's an exam question. We went on to see that if we had, say, 100 windings on the primary side and 100 volts, and we had only 50 windings on the secondary side, that we would have just 50 volts. Therefore, we would have stepped down the voltage onto the secondary side. Likewise, if we had 100 windings on the primary side and 100 volts, and 200 windings on the secondary side, the secondary side voltage would be 200 volts, and we would have stepped up the voltage. We went on to do calculations to do with changing voltages and primary and secondary windings, and we used ratios to do so. We saw a very complicated formula, but we stuck with the ratio of primary to secondary side in order to work out whether we've gone up or down with the number of windings or up and down with the number of volts. The exception to this rule is current. Current works in the opposite. So in other words, if we'd stepped up the voltage, we would step down the current by the same ratio. So if a primary side has 100 turns and 100 volts and 10 amps, if our secondary side had 1,000 turns, 1,000 volts, it would only have one amp on the actual secondary side. So in other words, we've turned, stepped up the voltage by 10 times. So we've gone from 100 to 1,000, but we've actually brought the current down by 10 times from 10 amps down to one amp. And we discussed the massive benefits with this with the distribution systems. So in other words, we've got a maximum voltage in the UK of 400,000 volts or 400 kV being used on the super grid, super high voltage, but therefore we've brought the current dramatically down making the conductors on the supply authority side considerably smaller. We did go on and mention some of the losses in transformers, even though our calculations had perfect transformers with no losses. We said the core itself can have a loss in it, and that is an eddy current loss. And they, we said that we overcome this by cutting the core or slicing it into what we call lamination. So each individual slice is insulated from the other individual slice and therefore making the core easily magnetized it might be soft iron but very high resistance making the actual eddy current that's induced into it considerably smaller than a core that wasn't laminated we mentioned hysteresis and copper losses on the way through but they won't appear in our level one or level two exam we did suggest that not all transformers had a primary and secondary winding that some transformers can be constructed of one winding and we looked at an auto transformer and we said sometimes these are used on the uh, grid system making them cheaper to construct and we also looked at them in the form of uh, little bell transformers uh, that can be used domestically so you can tap off the actual volts you need to drive your um, door entry system we mentioned this section SELV separated extra low voltage and we said this voltage range AC was up to a maximum of 50 volts or up to in DC a maximum of 120 volts we looked at how an SELV transformer has no outgoing connection to earth and therefore is electrically separated, which is a method of protection against electric shock, as well as the voltage being no greater than 50 volts AC as well. We will go on in the classroom to look at SELV transformers in a later set of notes as well and applications for them. We also looked at isolating transformers in the form of a transformer 
that supplies a shaver socket in a bathroom. This could still be at 230 volts, but again has no connection to earth on the outgoing side. Therefore the shaver inserted into the socket only has two pins. The earth pin is missing. The transformer that supplies the actual shaver socket itself is also an isolating transformer. Therefore no connection to earth on the outgoing side. Therefore no risk of shock on the outgoing side to earth. So just to recap then, basic instructions of a transformer looks like a primary and secondary winding. These windings are insulated, usually wrapped around something that's easily magnetised, such as soft iron. They are not physically connected together, only connected together through mutual inductance. In other words, the rising and collapsing magnetic field that's induced from the primary side is picked up by the secondary side. Calculations on transformers work on ratios. Transformers can be called in two main ways, either by oil or by air. We said that the, the loss that the exam may mention is the eddy current loss. This is overcome or greatly reduced by laminating the core of the transformer, in other words, slicing it up and insulating each slice from each other, making it highly resistive, but still easily